Hello and welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm Inka Vat. 77 years after the world's first atom bomb was released over Hiroshima, can Homiya Kishida's vision of a nuclear-free world be realized? With me to discuss this are Lai Yizong, the CEO of Taiwan think tank, the Prospect Foundation. Tony Hu, former U.S. Department of Defense Senior Director for China, Taiwan and Mongolia, and Germont Lari, retired U.S. Air Force Foreign Area Officer specializing in missile defense. President Lai, Tony and Germont, very warm welcome to the show today. Belarus's president, Alexander Lukashenko, has said there can be nuclear weapons for everyone. Russian tactical warheads are on the move into Belarusian territory. It's the Kremlin's first deployment of such bombs outside Russia since the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. The U.S. condemned the move as irresponsible and a provocation use of chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons in this conflict would be met with severe consequences. Um, but in response to this report, I will just add, we have seen no reason to adjust our strategic nuclear posture or any indications that Russia is preparing to use a nuclear weapon. Tony, how serious is this move? This is actually very serious. But the first thing that comes into my mind is the physical and command and control security of this weapons transfer because can batteries provide the, the physical security of these weapons or would a third party be able to take it? And also, if the command and control is not secure, right now the weapons in Russia are under a very secure command and control system. When they deploy it, the system to Belarus, will Putin still have that positive control? Or could it be ac accidentally launched and start a nuclear war by accident? So this is the threat that I think about. Because in the U.S., we have a very set procedure on nuclear surety. There are redundant physical protections when the we a nuclear weapon is in storage or when it's in on the move. And there is also a redundant system of validation of command when the command from the president is issued to launch the weapon. So our nuclear surety procedure, including the human factor, personnel reliability program in place is to ensure nuclear weapons is always under positive control. Safety controls there, you know, of paramount importance. Um, how about other aspects, Gamont, in terms of, you know, this, this move? I mean, Belarus uh, is, is party to the uh, non-proliferation treaty. So in terms of those sorts of issues, the legalities of this? They are under the control of Russia, the weapons. So they're not violating any kind of uh, non-proliferation treaty, uh, just like we have nuclear weapons in Germany and other countries around in NATO, mm -hmm. um, and that we're also going to be docking our SSBN in uh, in South Korea. So, you know, I don't I don't see it, see it as a problem from the point of view of any treaty, um, but as Tony said, uh, it is it is an aggressive act. Um, but it seems like we're also responding by, uh, by uh, assuring South Korea that we, we, we will provide uh, more show of our nuclear weapons in the, in the Asian theater. Mm. So I'm not sure mm. it's so uh, different, except like Tony said, uh, it's a, a physically in another country. Uh, and, uh, but the Russians are used to this. They used to, have this. they used to have missiles in Belarus, in Ukraine, and in uh, Kazakhstan, so mm -hmm. I, I feel so confident. Is it, so is it that serious then? Um, I, I, feel, I feel confident that it's that it, that that the Russians are going to control their nuclear weapons. President Lai, Gemont mentioned there, of course, the U.S. does have um, nuclear assets in in Europe. So you know, obviously, Russia has dismissed the criticism by the U.S. Why is the U.S. condemning this move if it does the same thing? Well, the issue is that Russia right now is conducting aggression against another sovereign state. And Russia is actually using nuclear uh, threats uh, to uh, threaten uh, other uh, powers uh, should they come to the aid of the Ukraine. Uh, when those powers, they are not actually attacking Russia. So the Russia is very proactive using the nuclear 
as a threat uh, for their aggressions. That's how the, the make these things so serious. Mm -hmm. Because uh, right now, Russia not only uh, used a nuclear threat on its own land, but also extended uh, the range uh, from Russia to the Belarus, even though Russia still control the nuclear weapon in Belarus. Now, the next thing is, should things coming from Belarus to Ukraine, for example, and uh, their, their projectile coming from Belarus, uh, there's a, a very reasonable uh, estimate that, that we believe that uh, those weapons could be, for example, nuclear weapons. Uh, if we, we cannot shoot it down, uh, then what else? Uh, should we just retaliate? Uh, <clears throat> because we know that uh, uh, after those uh, nuclear weapons, uh, probably they were going to shoot a second wave. So those are things that are easily to be escalated. I think the, uh, the issue why the Russia was uh, dismissive uh, due to the, uh, the fact that the U.S. also employed the similar nuclear weapons uh, in other areas, uh, despite the U United States still control them. But uh, the, the issue right now is that Russia is using that to cover their aggression. Mm. Uh, that is how the, uh, people are looking at it in a very different way. Mm. So, so it's in terms of the rhetoric, it is, is amping up this rhetoric, the threat, the rhetorical threat, as to whether he, Putin, actually presses go and actually makes this a nuclear conflict. Tony? Yes, I think the real threat is Putin's mental state, because it would be crazy for the Russians to use any kind of weapon in Europe, because the pre prevailing wind from the west to the east, the fallout will be all over Russia. Mm. If, we, if we consider what happened in Chernobyl, just small leak, and the area that was affected, mm. let alone a nuclear device deliberately exploding in Europe, it, the fallout is going to go right on Russia. So mm. um, I think. E even if it's a tactical. Even so if it's tactical, range. because tactical mm. nuclear weapon, its fallout will be much larger than Chernobyl, uh, a little mm. you know, nuclear power station release. So the real threat is would. Putin use it, and that's what I mean when I said the real threat is his mental state. Mm. Mm -hmm. Would he be crazy enough to use it? Mm -hmm. Gamont, um, Ukraine had the third, the world's third largest nuclear arsenal, but then in 1994, um, it decided to give that up uh, for security guarantees. Let's take a look at the Budapest Memorandum. The Russian Federation, the U.S. and the U.K. confirmed their recognition of Belarus, Kazakhstan and Ukraine becoming parties to the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. So the three nuclear weapon states agreed to, this is just a summary, number one, respect each signatory's independence and sovereignty within existing borders. borders. Number two, to refrain from either the threat or use of force against each signatory. And five, refrain from the use of nuclear arms against each signatory. So obviously, you know, these have been breached. Um, Correct. Was Ukraine right to give up its nuclear weapons? So uh, there's a little misconception there, just like we're talking about Russian nuclear weapons in Belarus. Those 3,000 nuclear weapons were actually under the control of Russia. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was a, from my, from my understanding, it was a, um, and, uh, a way to get the, those three countries to sign the non-proliferation treaty and also gently return the nuclear weapons back to Russia. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, um, the appearance that they had their own nuclear weapons is incorrect, that they actually were Russian nuclear weapons. Mm. But, but uh, if, nu if Ukraine had kept them, they were, under the, sort of, they were under the control of, of the Russian military the so whole they time. Weren't, so they, weren't, they wouldn't be able to use them? No. They, but they but were, it would make Russia think twice about uh, attacking Ukraine, right? They would have to forcibly take them from the Russian military, which would have caused a war. And mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure that the, the Ukrainians were in a position at that time to mm -hmm. prevent the Russians from withdrawing. It was, a, it was, a, it was, a, it was an agreement to allow the, the Ukrainians to return the weapons back to Russia and allow them to sort of uh, be assured. I, I, uh, not to play devil's advocate here, but uh, I would also point out that, that this agreement was not only broken by the Russians, mm. but also by the British and, uh, the, and the Americans. Yes, <laughs> yes, they, in terms of coming to Ukraine's aid, <laughs> yes, right? Yeah. Yes, okay, good point. Um, okay, so you're saying it wasn't a choice that, Ukra that Ukraine had to make? 
Right. Uh, right. right, exactly. I, I would also point out there were two other countries that weren't part of the, that memorandum, mm. but did sign something. Uh, China and, and France. Yes. And the, chi <laughs> uh, the China statement said, uh, in accordance with the UN Security Council resolution, blah, 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 on the 4th of December, 1994, on the, on the security assurances to Ukraine, and it's, it goes down there about uh, about threat of nuclear weapons and non-nuclear weapons, and, and it says, uh, uh, in the event of aggression or threat of aggression against Ukraine using nuclear weapons, that they would uh, get involved and um, they would bring the matter to the UN Security Council. Mm. And in this case, China also failed because mm. they had plenty of opportunities to speak up mm. and they abstained. Mm -hmm. um, so they broke their own agreement as well. Mm -hmm. And there was a more recent agreement actually with China. Yes, 20, 20, 2013, with China. 2013. Yes. <laughs> but this one was uh, contemporary to the Budapest Memorandum and mm. they didn't uh, do anything either. Yes, let, let down on all sides. Now let's go back to when the first nuclear weapons were used. In 1945, the United States dropped two atomic bombs over Japan in World War II to force its surrender. The city of Hiroshima lies prostrate after the withering blast which wiped out 53,000 of its population. Just four years later, the Soviet Union conducted its first nuclear test explosion. The United Kingdom followed in 1952, France in 1960, and China in 1964. These countries negotiated the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1968 and the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in 1996 to try to stop further expansion. Still, outside of these five nuclear weapon states, India, Israel and Pakistan possess nuclear arsenals but never signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty. North Korea withdrew from the treaty in 2003 and has tested advanced nuclear devices since that time. In May, an 85-year-old survivor of the Hiroshima atom bomb recalled the day it fell. Let's stay together. Why we are still together? My mother breathed in from the room. My father began to pull photos and bedding from the cupboard. あの、具体的な行動力を期待するんですけどね。ただ理想を掲げたり、決議文を so, which countries have nuclear weapons and how many? There are nine countries with known nuclear weapons, the original five nuclear weapon states, and then India, Pakistan, Israel, and North Korea. You can see from the estimated Global Nuclear Warhead Inventories 2023 that the bulk, 89 to 90%, are owned by the US and Russia. There's also an indication of whether those arsenals have gone up or down this year. G-Man, uh, how accurate uh, is that picture of the world's nuclear arsenals? Uh, I would say that the, um, the numbers uh, be, uh, that the United States and, and Russia declare are pretty accurate. It's part of the treaties uh, and it's part of the, the, um, the, trans yeah, the, the transparency between the two countries. Uh, the, all the other countries, those are mainly estimates and guesses uh, based on intelligence, based on leaks, based mm -hmm. on a variety of things. And so you have some countries um, who um, we, we perhaps know more about, let's say China, when they're building missile silos in the western uh, area of China, mm -hmm. you see missile silos being built so you can make estimates. But with like North Korea, it's more difficult because they hide them more and they are more protective of their, um, their situation. Israel, the same way. Uh, so all these countries uh, are, the numbers are estimates. At the G7, leaders issued a joint statement on nuclear disarmament titled the Hiroshima Vision. It says, we affirm our commitment to achieving a world without nuclear weapons with undiminished security for all. Nuclear weapons, for as long as they exist, should serve defensive purposes, deter aggression, and prevent war and coercion. Tony, let me ask you, uh, you know, 
ICAN, which is the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, say that G7 leaders actually haven't taken steps to reduce nuclear weapons. Um, in fact, they've invested more in upgrading their nuclear arsenals. So is the G7 really committed to a world without nuclear weapons? Actually, I believe, if you look at it carefully, the modernization effort is different from making new weapons because the weapons deteriorate through time. To ensure safety, it needs to be double-checked, it needs to be modernized. So this type of activity, I don't believe, counts as expansion, per se, other than China building more and uh, North Korea building more and Iranian trying to build. Mm. So those type of activity, therefore, is counter to nuclear disarmament that the G7 leader is, is looking for. Mm. I mean, that was, um, as G-Man mentioned, estimates in terms of you know, that global map that we saw. But um, uh, bring in President Lai, uh, there were arrows up on, for example, the UK. So how, how much can we trust you know, figures like unclassified or rough estimate figures like that? Obviously, they go by year to year, so they're working on the same, the same source figures. Of course, but I think uh, in a democracy, there is a check and balance system, and uh, many times you could uh, at least and have a um, within a ballpark and guess uh, about the uh, weaponries or the uh, nuclear devices that they have. Uh, so the uh, in the the UK and France, I think we can relatively achieve a, uh, a reliable estimate mm -hmm. about what they have. But of course, in China, uh, the North Korea. Uh, even Iran, uh, that is much more concealed. And uh, India could also, uh, uh, in that category, although India is a democracy, mm. because India still kept its uh, nuclear weaponry very secret uh, due to its need to face uh, both Pakistan and China. Mm. Uh, and I think that the, the criticism against G7 sometimes just too one-sided because the, real, the true offenders right now really is the, the China, for example, and also the Russia's aggressive uh, usage of nuclear threat, although not using the nuclear uh, weapon itself, mm -hmm. and also the uh, North Korea developing nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, we uh, also believe that uh, we could reduce a nuclear weapon if everyone reduce. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone uh, will try to uh, eliminate uh, the nuclear usage and with the advancement of the conventional weaponries, probably the nuclear weapons, that kind of the uh, uh, undiscriminated uh, uh, killing, uh, elimination of the, all the, everything within its reach, uh, mm -hmm. that would not be uh, necessary. But still, uh, the, some, a lot of people, they call the nuclear weapon as a poor man's uh, last resort. And sometimes that, that we have to eliminate that uh, possibility, either by uh, reassurance about the poor men, about their security, and also to eliminate the uh, madman, uh, mm. uh, the mentality uh, for using them. Mm. So, so do you see, President Lai, do you see the G7 leaders, for example, taking steps to, you know, they say they want to have a nuclear-free or nuclear weapon-free world, but are they actually taking steps to do that? I think that the declaration itself definitely demonstrates the kind of, uh, of the intention. Mm -hmm. uh, but looking at the, um, uh, the development of the Ukraine and how Russia successfully using the uh, nuclear threat uh, 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 to prevent uh, NATO as well as other allied nations for the Ukraine's defense. Uh, so the uh, country, even for Japan, they started to have a rethinking about their non-nuclear usage and the non-nuclear uh, positions and to be more acceptive mm -hmm. about the, uh, the nuclear uh, introductions mm -hmm. uh, into their own territories. Uh, and North, uh, South Korea, for example, uh, the general populace is uh, very supportive of building their own nuclear <laughs> weapons uh, due to their uh, threat uh, fr coming from the North Korea. Mm. So I think right now that, that when people are talking about the uh, disarmament and the uh, reduction of nuclear threat without uh, looking at the current context, sometimes uh, it is uh, too much away from the reality. Mm, okay. Mm. Um, well, you know, President Lai Ji Man mentioned South Korea, Japan. Now, both of these countries don't have nuclear weapons themselves. They come under the U.S.'s nuclear umbrella. Let's take a look at the countries that are in 
the US's or under the US's umbrella. Uh, you see there on the left the NATO, NATO countries, um, including Finland, uh, uh, newest member, and on the right we have the non NATO members, so Australia, Japan, and South Korea. So um, talk us through this umbrella. How does it work? How did it come about? Um, I just wanted to say one quick point uh, regarding the numbers. The numbers we saw earlier with 5,000 roughly with the U.S. and Russia, those are total numbers. The actual operational numbers, the ones that are ready to, lo to launch and load and, and fire, is down to maybe 1,500 by, by both countries. Mm -hmm. So just so that people don't get uh, mis the mis uh, misperception that 5,000 nuclear weapons are ready to fire. Mm. There's only about 1,500 on the, on the Russia. And just the other point is... Because, sorry, can I just jump in there? Yeah. So that, and that's actually as a result of the New START Treaty, Correct. which has limited the Correct. operational warheads to 1,500 for both Russia and the U.S. Exactly. And also, uh, the other point that I want to sort of supplement what President Lai said, China doesn't have any kind of constraint for the numbers of missiles that it can build. Mm. Russia and the United States do. Mm. So now you have a situation where you have a third party who's building their nuclear weapons uh, to the level of mm. uh, Russia and the U.S. And so for the, for, for the mm. first time in history, mm -hmm. the U.S. is now facing two nuclear powers that mm. can threaten them with the same number of missiles. And mm. so that's, that's the thing. President Lai um, you know, said, obviously, the only way to you know, reach this goal of a nuclear weapons-free world is for everybody to reduce. Um, but then the issue is, as you said, uh, China's rapidly increasing. That's because it's simply trying to match the US well, and Russia. Well, that's the appearance now, but it doesn't mm. stop them from making more. There's no, there's no limit mm. to what they, what they can do. Mm. And mm. it doesn't mean also that Russia and China could use their nuclear weapons together against the United States. So now you have a double amount because in the next uh, three or four years, China will have the same number of nuclear weapons ready to launch as the United States. Russia already has that, so now you have two against one. Mm -hmm. So I guess, uh, you know, the issue that the world has is China is an unknown quantity, whereas Russia and the U.S. at least, well, who knows about Russia now? Do you, do you think things have changed, Tony? Yeah, it, I'm very concerning because... Because they pulled out of New START. Right, treaty. and in a totalitarian regime, it's a one-man show, just like in China and in Russia. So there's no constraint to the leader. And this is nuclear weapon. When we talk about this kind of number, it's crazy. Because mm -hmm. this, we're talking about destruction of the Earth uh, uh, and the survival of mankind at this point. Now, these numbers I mean, really is meaningless. Truly, it's meaningless mm. if you look at the magnitude of destruction, each one of these yeah. wars. It, it's crazy. And so, like the beginning, we indicated 17, 77 years, the world lived in a situation where we did not have a nuclear war because of the mutual assured destruction strategy where both sides know if you use it, you'll be dead because the retaliation itself will also kill you. So it prevented nuclear war, and it's very effective. Um, that's under the situation where both sides understand that, you know, we'll be destroyed. I think the nuclear disarmament, the main purpose will be to ensure this type of device doesn't fall into a irresponsible organization, a terrorist organization, where they can detonate a device and destroy the entire city uh, the minimum missile warhead that I was in charge of, and uh, I was immediately in charge of launching 10, and I can launch 50 if the other guys don't have a chance to launch theirs. Each one of these warheads is uh, 23 times more powerful than the one that we, than the one we dropped in Hiroshima. Mm. 23 times. Can you imagine? Mm. When we do targeting and we look at the military complex we want to destroy, but the surrounding cities will be destroyed. Mm. President Light, there have been discussions about Taiwan coming under uh, the U.S.'s umbrella, nuclear umbrella. Uh, you know, what, uh, what does the U.S. need to consider in making that move? From our understanding about China is that although China said that it has no first use of nuclear uh, weaponry as a doctrine, but the China never said that it would not use against uh, its renegade provinces. So, so this is a very interesting loophole 
that uh, China probably could use a nuclear weapon so that the, uh, the nuclear umbrella uh, for some people in Taiwan, they really hope that the United States, uh, despite its TRA reassurance, can also have active usage mm -hmm. uh, umbrella cover Taiwan. Okay, Germont. I, I would uh, just add uh, to the argument that uh, President Lai is saying, uh, don't forget, Taiwan was under a nuclear umbrella from 1955 to 1979, and mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. there was in place a, a plan to protect Taiwan. Mm. And it is true what he said, that uh, since uh, China does not consider Taiwan an independent country, uh, the use of a nuclear weapon inside China doesn't violate any rule. Mm. Tony? On the other hand, there, there have been assessment that would a Chinese leader use a nuclear device on the Chinese people? Because remember, the people on Taiwan is also Chinese. Would he go down in history as the murderer of millions of Chinese people? So. Um, there was a, a assessment done many years ago that I've seen uh, that it is unlikely China will use this device against Taiwan just because within China itself, would, would be, there might, might be an uprising against this idea of killing uh, compatriots. Remember, they call Taiwan compatriots also. So uh, that's why I, 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 my thinking is uh, a nuclear umbrella for Taiwan might not be necessary because it it might be doubtful that China is going to use mm. such a device against it, it, you know the Chinese race. China would do the same thing that Russia is doing with regard to Ukraine. In other words, anybody interfering with Taiwan, they would choo they could choose to use a nuclear weapon to prevent anybody from arriving to help Taiwan. It might not be used against the people of Taiwan, but it might be used against the military that might be supporting Taiwan. So. I agree on that. Mm -hmm. They won't use it against Taiwan, but that may use against other area to prevent mm -hmm. uh, other people coming to the help of, uh, to help oh, Taiwan. Okay, President Lai. Um, I have to say that about the China not using nuclear weapon against Taiwan, uh, I think that conclusion really uh, drive too fast, because uh, look at the Communist Party killing its own people, uh, Cultural Revolution, uh, tens of million people died, mm -hmm. and also in all kinds of the other the, the civil war between the CCP, CCP and KMT. Uh, they could starve uh, about 400,000 people in Changchun, die just because Correct. of their, uh, the, the, the seas, uh, seas of Changchun. So we just cannot take everything for granted. Mm. So that's our view. Okay. And also China is not, um, we can't trust China in general because of the, all the treaties they've signed. <laughs> they don't live, up, they don't live up to them anyway. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, Jima, let's compare China's nuclear arsenal against the U.S.'s. We've got a uh, image here that shows uh, the different uh, delivery systems. Um, talk us through uh, what these various delivery systems represent. Uh, so the intercontinental ballistic missiles are in the, on the U.S. side are silo-based. This is where Tony uh, spent a, a portion of his Air Force career. Um, and about a, a, a quarter of the U.S. has those kind of uh, nuclear weapons in the ground. Mm -hmm. There are another about a quarter that are uh, airborne, available for uh, B-52 uh, or B-1 or, or uh, various bombers to use. And then finally, the, the majority of uh, more than 50% of our nuclear weapons are submarine-based. Uh, however, China is, uh, is the, the reverse. Uh, most of the nuclear weapons are ICBMs from land base, currently mostly mobile. Uh, mm -hmm but they're building another 1,000 nuclear weapons or 300 silos uh, in, in, the, in the western province. So that would uh, get them up to the numbers that the U.S. has. So, so tell us what that means in terms of their strategy. The land-based system actually supports first strike because land-based system is not survivable, even mobile system, because nuclear blasts cover such huge area. So, it more, so the more a country depends on land-based system, the more they are likely to use it for first strike because mm -hmm. they don't have a chance to shoot it if they wait until other countries first strike. Mm -hmm. That's why the United States put more in submarine mm -hmm. because that's survivable. That is the second strike option. If a country decides to strike the United States with nuclear weapon, mm -hmm. the subs are the ones that's going to ensure survival, retaliation, mm -hmm. and, and, and a valid threat mm -hmm. against any nuclear threat against the United States because mm -hmm. 
you can have first strike against the United States. You're not going to wipe out most of the United States nuclear arsenal, only a small portion, because majority majority of that stuff is underwater that you cannot detect, and, and you will suffer a nuclear strike. So looking at China, although they signed no first strike, right. mm. look at the, the employment concept. That's mm. a first strike employment construct. Mm, so that's the evidence. Okay. Now, Anthony H. Korsman is um, a U.S. national security analyst on global conflicts, including Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran, and Syria. He's currently the Emeritus Chair in Strategy at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He's led studies on national missile defense and weapons of mass destruction. He previously served as the National Security Assistant to Senator John McCain. Let's take a look. Do you believe, um, as some, well, some analysts do, that a Taiwan contingency would essentially be a nuclear conflict? Well, the problem with saying that is, what is the cost to everyone involved? If it becomes a nuclear conflict, particularly an intense one, a country, any small country like Taiwan, would very quickly almost see its strategic value vanish if that became a strike against cities and the population and the economy. If it escalated to the point where you started striking at ports in China, the cost to China would be immensely higher than the war is actually worth in terms of the benefits in terms of Taiwan. If China should strike at a critical long distance target a key U.S. base like Guam, no one could be certain that you wouldn't see a process of escalation start that would be a strategic nuclear war. So the problem, and I think the key behind nuclear weapons, is that they deter each other. The term we normally use is mutual assured destruction. And what that practically means is there's no way to know once you escalate where you stop, but it is very clear that when you begin to escalate, you can very quickly get to the point where there is so much damage on both sides that the war isn't worth fighting. Do you believe that what we need to be doing now is to try to agree what those, you know, let's call them guardrails or, or rules should be? Well, you know, if this was a children's game, you could talk about rules. But you need to realize what the numbers are here. You're talking about literally something on the order of 1,500 US strategic nuclear weapons. You are talking in the case of China about 410 is the most recent unclassified estimate, but they're going up to 1,200, essentially trying to match in a lot of ways the capabilities of Russia and the United States. So when you agree to rules politically for war fighting, the truth of the matter is that these agreements aren't going to last the moment you're actually involved in a, tr a real war. So how do you uh, view the, the existing treaties that, that we have? The non-proliferation treaty is an agreement not to have nuclear weapons. So it doesn't affect any of the aspects of nuclear war fighting between the major powers. And in the case of Taiwan or an escalation like the Ukraine or any similar situation, the issue would not be whether the Ukraine does or does not have nuclear weapons or Taiwan does or does not. The issue would be to what extent are smaller powers linked to the major nuclear powers, China, Russia, and the United States. The exceptions are countries like Iran or North Korea, which have small nuclear forces, but potentially could threaten even a major power with strikes on its cities or major sort of counter value targets. This is essentially a game, a kind of combination of chess and the game of Go, 
where everybody makes up the rules as they go along. So at this point, arms control, frankly, does not seriously impact on war fighting. In terms of the Ukraine war, how likely or how close do you believe that we are to a nuclear conflict? I think we are extremely distant. I mean, Putin's rhetoric has often been somewhat intense. He has basically reached an agreement with Belarusia to deploy Russian tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus. There's, the problem with that is that this is a sort of political gesture. If he actually uses those weapons, does more than issue threats, then he has to cope with the fact of what happens in terms of the reaction in Europe and the rest of the world. And again, if you start using nuclear weapons on a target like the Ukraine, what is left if it is an extensive use? You've already destroyed a good part of the economy. So what are you doing? You're invading a country with almost nothing left that is really worth conquering. These issues really are ones where you are going to see people bluffing, making political statements. So similarly, if Beijing was to use nuclear, even tactical weapons against Taiwan, it would be destroying a country that then has no value to Beijing. If China suddenly escalates to a nuclear strike that basically has to be very, very limited and almost symbolic, the problem for China is that basically what it can end up doing is mobilizing the entire world against China. China has to consider what the aftermath is. The more serious the escalation becomes, the more likely that the U.S. might have to respond in terms of some kind of limited strike that matched in some ways what China had done in Taiwan. And this creates the risk of escalation to a much more serious form of nuclear war. These kinds of risks are so great that no nation is going to take them carelessly. And you don't go to war to destroy your own country. And how do you read essentially the renuclearization um, of, of the world, you know, since, since, the, uh, since the Second World War, uh, since the Cold War. Uh, I understand that um, there has actually been an increase in warheads this year. Well, you have to be very careful when you talk about that. The counts on warheads that are available in unclassified literature are very rough estimates in general. We do have a good picture of the number of warheads in Russia and China, because even though the arms control agreements are no longer as binding as they once were, they still have led to accurate reports and counts. And there's no indication that the number of warheads is actually changing in serious ways. To put this in perspective, when you went to war with the first use of nuclear weapons in Hiroshima, uh, you saw a weapon which was the equivalent of 20,000 tons of TNT. Today, a strategic nuclear weapon may have a warhead which could be in excess of 5 million tons of TNT. That's an incredible increase. But those size of warheads has not increased over time. If anything, as weapons have become more precise and reliable, the yields have tended to go down. There's no indication that Russia or the United States have increased warheads. They already have 
immense numbers in storage. You have something on the order of 3,000 Russian weapons that are designed for theater use. The U.S. has only saved about 2,000. But to put this in perspective, when you look at the total number of U.S. and Soviet weapons today, it's about uh, 11,000. At the height of the Cold War, 1986, it was close to 70,000 active warheads. So you're not talking about an increase in warheads. What you are talking about is better delivery systems, more accuracy, much quicker reaction times, the ability to target far more precisely. And you're talking about the ability to understand the economy of other countries in ways where you can do far more accurate damage to its ability to recover and operate its economy if you go to a war that actually attacks the civil and economic population. So nuclear war fighting is evolving and it is becoming more lethal, but this isn't a matter of more warheads. Would you say it's, uh, it's most lethal globally uh, since the Second World War? No, not at all. I mean, when you had 70,000 warheads, the fact was one reason you had so many was they were far less accurate. If you were trying to attack the other side's forces before they could use them against you, you and you wanted to make it clear to the other country that you had the ability potentially to strike their nuclear forces, you had a vastly higher number. And a lot of these weapons then were directed against ground targets hardened silos. And when you attack a ground target, you create immense amounts of fallout compared to an airburst. So you had globally, and remember, almost all of these weapons in practice would then have been used basically against targets in the United States and Russia, not globally and at a secondary level against targets in Europe. Today, you do have North Korean weapons, the risk of Iranian weapons over time. And the one power that really is changing its nuclear forces and increasing warheads is China. Now, as yet, that's 250 to 410 in unclassified terms. But when you compare that to 6,000 on the side of Russia and 5,200 strategic weapons on the side of the United States and another four to 3,000 weapons that can be used tactically. This is not at this point in time anywhere near as globally threatening as it was during the Cold War. Now, what will happen as China does deploy its full nuclear strength, and none of us know what its goals and objective and timing is, that's a different story. We don't have the ability to predict the future with any accuracy. We do know that China is not part of any arms control agreement. We do know that it's expanding not only its forces, but its capability to manufacture weapons and putting new reactors into operation that can help produce significant increases. But whether it will actually get to the levels of Russia or the United States and how it will get there is anybody's guess. President Lai, we just heard the interview with um, Dr. Cordesman there. Um, he doesn't agree with some analysts that uh, and yourself, that the mm -hmm. conflict over Taiwan would end up being a nuclear mm -hmm. conflict. You know, he says you don't go to war to destroy your own country. So why do you believe that it could escalate into a nuclear conflict? The issue is still that uh, the when and uh, based on what uh, leadership that you are doing the assessment with 
and also the uh, the Chinese is when they talk about the war on Taiwan, uh, when they started the war, uh, they are going to uh, talk about uh, or their objective is actually capture Taiwan, and you think go south, uh, and when their leadership about their uh, legitimacy is um, at, at stake, then they will do everything it takes uh, to secure their legacy there. And the legacy right now is that they they want to be the one that captured Taiwan rather than losing Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And based on the uh, the past history about CCP, uh, would no matter how much sacrifice they will have to take, uh, but that they want to achieve their objective, especially mm -hmm. during the Mao Zedong era. Uh, and then Xi Jinping is the similar you know, characteristic, just like Mao Zedong. So I really do not uh, take the uh, the Chinese would not. Uh, destroy Taiwanese people uh, for the sake of the we are the same people, so that I'm not going to destroy you. Mm. Uh, that's how, how about destroying their own people, though? Because the, I mean, Cordesman talks about the the escalation, what the U.S. would have to do, and the, the issue. Uh, yeah. I think the uh, the China mm. always ha uh, strategic community always have the uh, the theory that United States will never fight China. In first, they will never fight the land war on China. That is, U.S. Ne will never uh, uh, send the military into China to fight. Second, uh, the U.S. will never fight China in a nuclear war. That's, that's what they believe in. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> so that uh, 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 when they drop the nuclear weapon on Taiwan, they will claim that uh, this is the, uh, uh, their uh, uh, sacrifice uh, in order to achieve this objective, uh, punishing their own people. <clears throat> But uh, should the uh, but they do not should the United States want to uh, have a nuclear exchange with them? Of course, they would, would they would do that. But uh, they do not think that the United States would is there uh, mm -hmm. to do the thing the similar thing against China. Whether those uh, assessment is correct or not, uh, that's a different story. But that tells us about the uh, mentality and how they are doing the as assessment about others. Okay. So as long as you've got thirty seconds left, so I need to ask okay. you all the final question, which is. Uh, let's start with G-Man first. Um, do you see the world eventually becoming nuclear weapons free? Is it something that's a reality? No, I don't. And I think uh, we'll see the reverse. As was mentioned in the beginning, I think we'll see uh, a South Korea eventually building their own nuclear weapons. I see uh, followed that by Japan. And I think that after those two countries become nuclear armed, uh, Taiwan will probably be in the same position. Mm. Tony? I don't see it. I don't see it become nuclear free. Mm. President Lai? Mm, hope it could be possible, but uh, no, the nuclear free is not going to happen at uh, the present time. Okay. President Lai, Tony Gemmock, thank you so much for joining our show today. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ian Kavat of Taiwan Talks. If you liked our show, please search for us on YouTube, give us a thumbs up, and hit subscribe to our channel. Feel free to leave us any feedback in the comments section.